It is with great pleasure that I now get to introduce today's speaker, Rod Ofton. Rod is a fourth generation rancher who operates a rotational grazing operation on 400 acres near Coon Valley, Wisconsin. He has around 30 cow-calf pairs and grass finishes approximately 100 head per year that he sells direct to consumers and to the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Cooperative. He also raises pastured pork and range-free layers. He holds a BS from the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York, and an MBA from Boston University. Mr. Ofta has over 25 years of experience in the food industry, including time working in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. He is president of the Norris Group Consulting and has been the general manager of the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Cooperative since its inception in 2008. The title of this morning's talk is Keys to Achieving Top Finish for Beef on Grass. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Rod Ofton. So Rod, you're free to share your screen. Okay, thanks a lot, Rich. Okay, we'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, a little bit more about me. Uh, um, I have a consulting company that pays for my farming habit. So that's the uh, the reason you see that on the screen. Um, and what most Rod, of what we're gonna talk, yeah. Yes, we don't see your presentation yet. Okay, sorry, I didn't share the screen yet. Thanks, Rich. How's that? I still do not see it. Okay. You may have to stop share and, and select again. All right, let's try that again. Okay, I see it now. You got her now? Okay. Yep, and you just need to start the slideshow. Yeah. How's that? Wonderful. Very okay. Good. <laughs> Sorry about that. We did practice this morning and it worked fine then, but anyway. Um, yeah, so I talked about uh, our farm is called Willow Creek Ranch. We do have a consulting company that helps pay for my farming habit. Um, what we're going to talk about today is really tips that I've learned, uh, not from a scientific background, but just really fairly easy things that have allowed us to fine tune our operation. And I'm going to be sharing those with you today. So more of learning from the School of Hard Knocks than any academic uh, institution. However, before we get into the slide, show uh, we have a slight poll just kind of to understand who you are and, and what you're uh, doing in your operation. So Rich, can you run the poll please? So take a second and fill out these three questions if you be so kind. You may need to scroll a little to see all of the questions and the answers. And when we are done, I will share the results. And once Rod moves on with his presentation, you may need to have to hit the, the small X in the upper right of the uh, poll to get this uh, image off of your screen. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share the results of the poll. So Rod, do you see the results? I do, yep. Thanks, Rich. I think we'll take it from there. So, well, it looks like we're all in the right place this morning. Uh, super heavy beef concentration with, uh, but also looks like there's a lot of diversity out there with other species, which is great. Um, and then really heavy, heavy on the cow calf to finish experience as well as uh, um, quite a bit of experience in, in ranching in general. So that's excellent. All right, that, that's great, Rich. Okay, well, let's kick off then. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about and share our learnings from uh, a successful grass-fed beef production system. And the, and the picture that I like to draw here is, it's like any strong table uh, as a platform that has four uh, legs that really support the stability and the productivity of that of that strength of the table. Uh, so the four things we're going to focus on today are feed quality, uh, genetics, uh, time, uh, and winter management. Uh, and there's a lot to go uh, build off of each of those words, but we'll uh, touch on each of those as we go. If people do have questions, please uh, please ask them as we go, um, just to make sure we can touch on them when they're relevant. 
And should we need uh, to speed up, we'll maybe limit questions or just kind of graze over some of the um, some of the slides faster. So first of all, in terms of uh, feed, um, the importance is obviously feed quality and quantity, uh, quality that animals are getting enough to eat and they're also getting good stuff of what they are eating. And again, these are all key things to weight gain and fat uh, deposits. And I thought I'd touch on, I think most of you probably are heavy into grazing, but um, you know, again, touch on the importance of rotational grazing. So I got into rotational grazing simply because I read somewhere that uh, you can produce 30, 40% more uh, forage from the same uh, land base by allowing grass to rest. So the principles of rotational grazing are important. Um, most of you, again, probably are very familiar with that, but again, the grazing mantra of take half, leave half. Uh, and this slide really kind of shows that, uh, that saying in a, in a physical way. So the, the uh, plan in A is overgrazed by the second picture on the A uh, row, grazed really all the way down. And what happens there uh, in, a, in a nutshell is that the root system gets overstressed. It reduces in an effort to repopulate uh, po the plant. And in long term, you have you, your overall uh, uh, production suffers. Uh, and then the picture in B, you see the classic take half, leave half. The root system stays quite strong and abundant, allowing uh, a quicker recovery. So one thing I'd like to share with you are different options that we've used to more or less extend our, our grazing, uh, the productivity of our existing grazing lands and manage them according to the seasons to really maximize forage. What, this picture here, uh, this is in the heart of the Driftless area of Wisconsin that could be in the Catskills, it looks like by the uh, some of the slopes. And this is one of our pastures um, where I call it a flex pasture because depending on the time of year, if you look to the upper left on that picture, you'll see the temporary fence. I cut hay on that whole hill for the first crop and then we slowly drop that fence down the hill and then we graze it as um, you know our hay supplies get plussed up and or uh, as we have different management skills and or if we don't have enough, uh, enough forage, um, depending on your management goals, the, the flex fence is really neat. The reason I'm talking about the seeding in, that's obviously not a new concept, but I've only been doing this about four, four years. And again, I learned about it at some conference. In a nutshell, what you see there, I'm drilling in sorghum sedan and we do it in about 20 acres. Uh, we keep pretty good records, just trying to understand what we do different years, what brings us different results. And the last four years that I've seeded, seeded in sorghum sedan, I'm averaging in about 35 additional bale produced in my third cut than I had in the same land mass before. So if you do the really rough math and those bales are around a thousand pounds to make things simple. And if you can say you may be paying at least a hundred dollars in the winter time for those kind of uh, that type of bale, um, we're generating $3,500 uh, for an in, in incremental um, production value. So the seed usually costs around 600, sorghum is pretty, uh, pretty reasonable, but in any time in your operation with a little bit of effort that you can net $3,000 more approximately from doing something uh, different is something you should really look into and I would strongly suggest. On that note, we always seed in late. So usually after second cut, um, late July, late June or early July, sorghum does require um, high temperatures to to um, to take off. And again, I'm saying that because I tried to beat Mother Nature one year and plant it early, and it totally failed. So again, learn from me and my mistakes, uh, and make sure you plant it uh, when the weather's uh, pretty warm. I think they want average soil temps above 60 degrees is the recommendation. So here's another exact same angle. And what you see there is I'm now I'm grazing the upper part and that's the old nice flex fence there uh, bouncing around. But you see the, the sorghum really starting to take in the hay field. Uh, and this is probably late, uh, late August um, after we've done a second cut, third cuts coming back and then we'll harvest that. And then this is just over the hill, but this is uh, in late October of the last fall. Um, so you don't need to, a cow doesn't have to have a smile on its face to, to know when they're happy. And this is, uh, you know, these are some happy cows. And this type of forage abundance and the high energy levels of sorghum can really, really let you put on weight in a time of year normally when forage is pretty sparse. So let's talk about uh, harvested forage. Uh, most of us are working in a climate where we've got to deal with winter. Uh, so we really need to think about uh, the forage, not only in the, the quantity, but also the quantity. 
Um, a lot of folks think, hey, my cattle are getting all the hay they can eat. I don't know why they're not gaining. Your relative feed quality and feed value is very important. So just because a hay bale looks nice, uh, you should try to get it tested. Most of our, uh, locally, most of our uh, food feed cooperatives will actually do some testing for your, uh, for your hay for free. And then lastly, palatability is important. Even if a hay looks good, but the core may be moldy um, and animals are, are not eating as much as they would normally eat, um, they're not gonna have the intake that you want either. So uh, make sure you think about all of those um, factors when you're working on your harvested forage. Rod, we had yes. two. We had two questions in the chat. Uh, sure. One was, "How do you manage prussic acid?" Okay, um, I've never had an issue with it, um, and I, if I understand it, the um, that the acid uh, issue is um, an overdose and over potentially toxicity at a certain stage of the plant. And from what I also understand, it becomes a danger potentially with frost and freezing. Um, we've we we uh, graze it fresh. I don't get to the point where I actually. Uh, use it when it's frozen. We don't go into winter storage, so I've never had an issue. Um, I did ask around before we planted it about that, and most guys said, listen, if your cattle are used to grazing, the only issues go from if they're, they have a heavy corn diet or a heavy, you know, dry starchy diet, and they get let loose into a, a really ripe field, uh, they may have some toxicity issues as well then. But because ours are always grazing, and I don't put them in there on an empty stomach, and there's a mix of other forage, we've never had a problem. What was then, the other question? The second question was, did you feed that into live grass? Then uh, have your regular, what happens to your regular grass when the sorghum dies out? Yeah, so the regular grass comes back fine in the following year. It is an annual, so the sorghum dies out. Um, I think we may even get some residual benefits of, because the plant's a bit bigger at the root base, uh, some infiltration, water infiltration improvements, but there's never been in, any issues in terms of, you know, overcrowding uh, or, you uh, taking out the other uh, grasses underneath. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks, good questions. Um, so getting into uh, baleage, um, so there's a classic farmer debate here locally where if I talk to certain producers about why they don't do baleage, the first thing you know in farmer communities is cost, 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 cost. And I know it is more expensive. Normally just the wrapping, if you have to source it out is, is around $9 a bale. Um, and then you've also got the cost of either renting the wrapper, but there's so many values that um, if you take the, the higher um, nutrient content, um, the other things that I've learned about just studying is if, if you're harvesting it, let's say you rake it once and then you wet wrap it, you may be saving two or three rakings and that's time and, and, and energy. The other thing, if you're not flipping the hay three times to get dried, and harvesting it sooner, you're going to have more leaf content that you won't lose through the raking or through the drying. And then because it's also more moist, you've got more nutrition density. And then that fermentation adds a palatability increase for the cattle. They just eat it like cotton candy. So I'd highly recommend, think about that if you don't. Um, we have a wrapper that we invested in and we do a lot of this. The other thing is if my if we have a really good year, my dry hay, I have more room in my shed. Uh, you can store these outside. Uh, they now recycle the plastic. So I'm just a really, really big fan of wrap baleage and uh, would consider in terms of uh, uh, harvested forage that you look at this hard if you're not doing it already. So this is a pretty busy slide and you know you all can get the, the, the summary, um, but talking about rotational grazing and maximizing your producti productivity, your pastures are gonna have to let them rest. So you know, make sure you're following those principles of rotational grazing. Uh, cattle do need to get an all-you-can-eat uh, a, a diet. So if you're limiting their intakes by any means and then still wondering why they're not gaining, gaining weight in fat and muscle is simply uh, how much feed do they take in and what is the quality of that feed. So it's those two simple things you really got to uh, stay on to. Higher palatability, if it uh, leads to them eating more, will create a better weight gain. Um, we'll talk a little bit about later about uh, temperature management, and we do offer supplements um, uh, a qualified grass-fed uh, molasses in the wintertime that I'll show you some pictures of. Uh, we also started uh, three years ago doing uh, leader follower groups. So that is, we're letting the finished cattle always get the best of the best. So that group goes in front of the cows. We move them off pretty fast and the cows, calf pairs come in. Secondly, cows are nature's miracle of being able to really 
keep keep weight on and feed calves in any kind of uh, forage and even marginal forage. So no, it's kind of wasting the best of the best if you give give that to your cow cow group. Talked about the flex pasture systems. If it's an option for you, because um, you can really extend your productivity of land there and look into interseeding. And all of these different things are tricks simply to ex extend the grazing season. Uh, I do a lot of work with a grazing calculator and the grazing calculator shows almost in any region the consistently um, relationship between harvested forage cost and grazing and are almost always four to one. So just think of that as every single day that you can extend the grazing season with a variety of these suggestions is putting money in your pocket. And that really should be the goal of, of all of us. I know we're gonna have to deal with winter eventually, but even winter grazing or bale grazing, all these different tricks can improve your bottom line. Hey, Rob. And, yeah, the question. Uh, how late do you guys graze out there? So ideally this year we were able to graze up until early December. Um, we'll stockpile some uh, pastures that they will be able to produce forage uh, with as long as there's no snow. And we didn't get snow until early December this year. Now, I know a lot of folks that are super conventional, they'll start putting out bales because they overgraze, they burn up their pastures. They're feeding out bales as early as sometimes late July or August. So again, think of the grazer versus a traditional producer that may be har putting out harvested forage that early. You're making money 90, 120 days of the year that they're not. So pretty, pretty important. So yes, you're right. If you were sharp looking at your picture, the water was not a leg on our table. I'm not going to talk about it long, but I did want to touch on it briefly because it can be a limited factor. I was talking to a co-op member recently who just couldn't figure out. He was given the cattle the best of the best. He had super duper expensive genetics. And when I w w walked through his operation, kind of looking at things, he had great feed, good, you know, fairly good looking cattle. Um, they were efficient, they had uh, uh, smaller frames. But as we walked back to the house, uh, I, I saw his water tank was frozen over. And I said, well, you should probably buy um, one of these things that keeps your water tank from freezing because water is extremely important. And he looked at me kind of confused and he said, well, it's only water. They don't gain weight from water. But you know, for those of us that know cattle will really a leather limit their dry matter intake if they're limited on water. And secondly, if they're forced to eat snow, which they will, that's cooling their body temperature even more, requiring them to take in more feed and causing inefficiency. So really, really, you know, it sounds super simple, but there's a pretty knowledgeable producer that was overlooking something as simple as water. Now, even in the summertime, you don't want uh, your finishers going a long distance for water. So make sure fresh water is available in the paddocks for the, your, your finishing cattle. Now, if you have cows in a range or if you maybe aren't just as disciplined with, with cows in the summertime, um, they can travel farther distances without really um, inhibiting any, uh, any, any uh, growth or productivity issues. Okay, so we got feed quality. Let's get on to genetics. Um, so I get the question a lot, Rod, what's, what's the best animal? What should I buy? You know, I should got to buy Angus, right? This is better than that. And I really, I don't get into the, what for me is a Ford versus Chevy versus Chrysler argument. Uh, you know, there are really good Devons out there. They're really good Angus. And there are some really bad black Angus out there too. So I talk a lot about uh, the phenotype when we look at genetics. So um, some of those things that uh, I'll just top line here, um, the average people, uh, the average uh, productivity of a cow in, in a, a dairy herd in, in Wisconsin, I think is four years. And the break even point on a cow is four and a half years. So really look for longevity genetics um, because you'll need that in a cow calf group to, to make money. Obviously fertility. Um, when we first got in, we converted from, um, we converted from dairy into beef. And the initial time I had some cows that really, you kind of love the way they look, they're real docile. And I would give them an extra year. Oh, she didn't take this year. Maybe it was the bull's fault. We don't make any excuses anymore. If they're not, if they don't have high fertility, uh, they're not fitting in our program, and they go down the road. Um, another th interesting thing is low to moderate milk. And you know, beef are, are made for beef consumption and putting muscle and fat on their bones. They don't need a massive bag. And that's going from dairy to to beef. Something I I struggled to understand. As a, being an, an original dairy guy, you think these big these big bags are really going to make awesome beef. And that's really not always the case. So, um, and also moderate frame. So uh, you're looking for something, you know, three to five max. Uh, so sh lower to the ground and really, really efficient. Um, we've got highly efficient uh, belted Galloways, some low line Angus, some Devons, 
So again, a lot of different breeds that are that are known for their efficiency, but they don't just have to be a certain a certain breed. And lastly, obviously, you can survive and thrive without the props. If something needs to be dehorned, if something needs a wormer, um, when most cattle that are properly rotated, um, then that those animals aren't doing their job in your group and should probably be culled out. Any questions up to this point? If not, okay. So let's get into some pictures. Uh, rather than you know showing a ton of really nice ones, it's probably easier to to focus on. Uh, ones that are not working. Um, here we've got a, a bull that's a frame eight, so a lot of mass and a lot of size. And I have a lot of friends, conventional farmers, that they just prize themselves on taking the fattest steer, the highest weight steer to the market. This one could be a go good bull for that because he's definitely massive. But the energy requirements of that size of an animal, you will never be able to finish him properly on grass, is, is my learning. So, um, if, if you see that coming or if you introduce a bull like that to your herd, you're going to have some issues down the road. So better off just to stay away from it. Here's another one that would make me run the other direction. Um, if you look at this, uh, this Angus bull, the, 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 the area between the flank and the back is really high. You see how the, uh, the hips go up and there's a lot of air under that animal. So you could almost get the whole body size of that animal in the air underneath the belly to the ground. And that's something you, again, high framed animal, a lot of bones gonna require a ton of energy uh, and you'll struggle to get a good finish on anything with that uh, genetic line. So that, again, something I would stay away from. Yeah, nice black hide probably works well in a conventional program, but uh, in a grass-based program, you wanna stay away from an animal like that. So we wanna talk to time a little bit. This is our third leg. Um, and I think it's important because Again, if you have not been a rotational grazer all your life and, and just you want to measure yourself by your own standard of maybe 16 to 18 months in a conventional program, and then you're, you're wondering why at 20 to 22 months you may not already be there, it simply takes longer if you don't have the crutches or you're not using things as growth hormones or really super high energy feed. So it's going to take time. So mentally manage those expectations. Um, if you want to market at a certain time of year, you know, think through calving. Uh, we calve in the fall, we buy a lot of feeders, but we calve in the fall um, simply because uh, we finish on average 24 to 26 a month. And that does really well um, for the most part in our program. Uh, there are a lot of other benefits. I won't talk about necessarily fall calving. Um, I get mocked for it quite a bit, but when I ask people why you calve in the spring, they say, well, that's nature's way. We've always done it that way, which is a terrible answer. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you think what is nature's way, put in, a, put a bull in with a cow hill, hill breeder any, any month of the year. I, and a lot of friends that I observe in the spring, uh, temperature is very, uh, very unpredictable and they lose a lot of calves. I had a, a friend lose, uh, about 20%, 30% of his calves last year with bad weather. And that will really knock a program down. So one, one reason to think about not trying to sell fall calving, but, um, one reason to at least consider that. So lastly, again, be patient. Um, it may well take uh, 24 plus months to really get the, the proper finish on grass. If you're doing less than that, good for you. Uh, I probably can learn a lot from you, but I've just learned to accept that the time doing it in a natural fashion. Uh, they're just an, an age point where we can all remember when we were younger, you can eat when you're a teenager and not gain an ounce. And then you get in a bit more mature like animals do and, and uh, a lot of uh, what goes in go straight to fat or, or, or maybe not muscle deposits, but straight to fat anymore. So, um, so again, be patient on that one. So we're going to talk a bit about a finished animal. Um, even a lot of ranchers that have done, been doing this a, a long time aren't really comfortable maybe judging cattle, uh, judging cattle weights. If you're not comfortable with it, um, one suggestion is maybe go to a sales barn and uh, simply watch cattle when they come in and, uh, you know, look at the traits, I am up, and these are the things to look for. Um, I've done that with a few people that were new to cattle, and you get pretty quick, pretty good pretty quick by looking at diverse uh, types of cattle, different sizes, different breeds. And it's also really interesting to see what's really loved by the market and what's not liked by the market. And often more traditional uh, grass-fed cattle types like Belted Galloways, maybe Murray Grays, um, get kind of beat up a conventional market. So it's, it's, it's interesting to watch that. But some of these things to look, look for again, uh, the tail head, 
um, on either side of the tail, if you're looking at from the back, when they're starting to finish, you should see a little, a little lump. It looks kind of like a grapefruit cut in half if they have a really nice finish. Uh, that's from the back end. That's the easiest way to tell. You'll see the flank there is nice and flat. So it's going kind of from the rib section straight to the back, really well filled out. Um, the ribs, you shouldn't see, be able to see a heavy uh, dentation from a ribs in a well-finished animal. Um, it should be kind of smooth like this, this animal is. And then the heart girth should be really nice and thick and the brisket's gonna be really jiggly and full. Uh, so start getting those traits in an animal, you know you're getting closer to be finished. And that's a way to judge potential finish without actually taking the hide off or sending the animal down the road. So that can be, that can be key to your program. Any questions on, on genetics right now? Not yet. Okay. So why is, you know, why is all this finished stuff important, Rod? I like to send them down the road at 20 months. Uh, in the co-op, I get a lot of people call and say, Rod, my, ca my cattle are finished. I'm ready to ship them. And I'll say, are you sure they're finished? And they, yep. Uh, well, how do you know they're finished? Well, I'm out of feed. <laughs> well, that means you're ready to ship them, but the cattle may not finish. And the importance of proper carcass finish, um, we can't talk enough about it. So let's get into that. Um, for, so first of all, financially, uh, and this example is our co-op, and it just takes an animal, um, the scenario I'm trying to run here is the exact same animal, um, but two different scenarios. So you've got the animal growing, and at 24 months, it, I'm just using a, um, a live weight estimate or a scenario of 975 pounds, which at a 60% would give you a hot carcass weight there, about 585. And I'm just guessing that this would struggle to be into you know, lower to the middle select range. Now, the importance of that is our cooperative has a, a pay scale, and we've got six different pay ranges all based on finish. And the reason that's important to the co-op is finish is indicative of the eating experience. So if you have a highly marbled animal, that animal is going to be an outstanding eating experience, going to bring your customers back. Uh, if it's really, really lean, let's say super lean, maybe standard or low select, almost like venison, it's going to be a less desirable eating experience and may not give the enjoyment of your brand that you want. So I'm just using this co-op uh, example because if, they, if the fin animal finishes higher, we, you will get paid more. So we'll stick with the first column, the 24 months. Uh, at that 40 select range, the co-op will pay $2.50 hot carcass weight. Then you get a gross revenue and then you see obviously your, your, your return. And then the scenario I wanted to play out is that exact same animal, but if you simply give it three more months, you're gaining two and a half pounds a day on, on good feed. Uh, and that would bump you up into the choice area, which uh, in the co-op gets you an extra dime uh, above mid uh, high select. So you're looking at 235 hot carcass weight versus pay price. Now it's quick to say, okay, Rod, yeah, sure. You're going to get paid more, but you had to feed that dang animal all that extra time. Well, even after accounting for the gross revenue and then taking out an extra 90 days of feed, um, you're still netting, $197.25 more on that animal, even after taking out the cost of feed. So the argument there is, isn't that worth waiting? If you've got a group of 10, 20 animals you're going to send and you can make a $200 difference, even after accounting for feed per head, you're talking to thousands of dollars. Now, some of you may say, well, Rod, we do all direct marketing, you know, the co-ops, no scenario. So this does is not relevant for us. You know, I, I would argue that it is. Um, High quality products, again, the better marbling, the better that eating experience and the better the enjoyment your customers have, the more they're gonna come back and the quicker they're gonna come back to buy more. And if you have a really bad experience, they may not, uh, may not come back at all. And you, know, you wanna risk that in your efforts. As I market uh, grass-fed beef, I hear from tons of meat managers and, and chefs, um, you know, I've tried grass-fed beef, leave my shop, it's terrible stuff. The industry has come a long way in the last 10 years. Um, we had our first prime animal last year and I would have never thought it, but uh, we, you know, as we keep on honing and honing, uh, it was a 585 pound belt of Galloway. So again, 585 pound carcass, most people hear that and they think, you know, terrible result. It was a beautiful result. So it, but again, it was a smaller framed animal, really plump and thick, uh, but not just a huge overall carcass size, but pretty rewarding. So again, people that uh, are really excited and love the eating experience, they may come to you for the environmental impact of rotational grazing. They may come to you for the animal welfare, the human health aspects, but they're gonna come back because they love your product. All right, let's, uh, something else I've really focused on in uh, 
is winter uh, forage management and body temperature. Um, again, you know, having farmed a lot, most of my life, um, the, the body temperature thing was a, a focus of a, a conference I was at a few years ago. And, and it was kind of a eureka moment because it really made so much sense. And it's so easy to manage and it has such a huge impact uh, on the outcomes. So any questions on the, on the genetic piece or the before we move on? So basically your farm consists mostly of Devon's belted Galloway's and then some little line Angus. Yes, we, well, we have uh, mostly Angus are probably 80% of our genetics. And again, not that I think uh, they're necessarily all that much better, but now and then if you get pink eye, or let's say you just have to move a few animals through, through your system, if they go to the conventional market, uh, certified Angus has done a great job marketing and you'll get uh, five to 10 cents higher for an animal that has a black hide. So that's really why we, we stick with that. But we have introduced uh, the, the Galloways. I really like them for efficiencies. Um, and uh, the, the Red Devons, we've had a lot of really good luck with them too. But like I said, there's uh, we have some neighbors that have a, a British White Park uh, uh, primarily group and they, they have some nice animals too. So and then Were one there more any other are, questions on genetics. Yep. Are you crossing your animals? We are. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we always have a traditionally we've one year we've had a really nice uh, low line Devon bull, but we usually have all uh, uh, low line Angus bulls. We really quick. We I always have a backup bull. A lot of people say oh, that's a, really a waste of feed, but I've heard too many stories about you know something happens to a bull you come to preg check in the spring and you're checking 30, 40 cows and, and 80, 90% are open. That's a disaster. So I call it an insurance, you know, insurance, insurance is never free, but you're usually glad you have it when you need it. And we've had really, really good. That's one other thing not to get back to the fall calving piece, but uh, insemination rates are always higher in cooler weather. You know, a semen has a tough time in really hot, hot climates. Uh, and we have some really good luck with, with that in the winter too. Any other genetic questions? Yep. Well, more more on the meat side. Okay. Um, so when animals are evaluated, how, how do you determine whether select, choice, or prime? Excellent question. So uh, we process on a federal plant, and our, we've asked our processor, and they're, they're happy to do that, to, to do it for other programs. Um, there's one guy who's been in the meat industry longer than I've been alive. Uh, he goes in and really more or less eyes it up. Now, you can argue, okay, Rod, well, that's not official USDA grader. Is he using a scale? Is he using the, the matrix, the plate that goes over the ribeye? No, he's not. But his, we, I've double checked um, his, um, we went up there and walked through with a, with a real USDA grader and he's always right plus or minus 10%. And he, he gives our producers, cause we're not there to punish them. We just want to have good data. He usually errs on the side of caution. So our official statement in the, in the sheet that we get, we have kidney fat, ribeye fat, cover size, all kinds of data by carcass. And it says graded to USDA standards. So that's how we do it. You can also have a real USDA grader uh, that's trained and, and certified in that, but it's quite expensive. So we're just trying to use it again, not as a black and white system, but something to really help filter our, uh, our quality. Very cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, good. I think we're doing good on time there. Um, so again, um, it sounds like we're all, um, you know, dealing with uh, old man winter in one format or, or another. Um, you know, we can't graze all year long, even though we're, you know, 100% uh, grass fed programs. So we need to to manage uh, temperature and, and, and winter forage. Um, so the first one there, it says, sounds like common sense, think through your goals and resources. But the number of folks that I've I've had, if you're going to, if you're going to take 30 head through the winter, you know, their, their body weight and animal eats 3% of its body weight a day, calculate what you think you're going to need for your winter feed and then add probably 25% would be my suggestion. The unfortunate folks that don't think that through, maybe get a deal, throw in a double their herd size in late November, December, and they run out of feed in January. I pity them because you go to a feed auction in January, February, you're going to pay top dollar for marginal feed. So think that through. It's so much, so worth that bit of time and effort simply to plan out and make sure you have uh, extra hay. I, that's another place where I'll call insurance. Maybe I'll usually plan even 30 to 40 percent. And if I've got 50 bales left in my in shed in the in the spring, uh, no worries. Um, 
Uh, that's something I'd rather do. Hay will be fine nutrition wise, but it, the other scenario, maybe you can even sell some, but the other scenario running out of feed is a disaster financially for your program. So again, winter gains about, a, you know, almost a third of our year are uh, colder temperatures. And if you're not managing the winter and the temperature well, you can gain really well in the spring, summer and fall, and you can be almost totally set back through poor winter management. So a really, really important part of our system. And then lastly, I'll touch on a number of the different feeding systems that are very reasonable. And you, know, you may be told by certain folks, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. There's a lot of different ways to do that, that are, uh, are effective and also uh, fairly reasonable. So just a couple of uh, pictures real quick. So this is outdoor bale grazing where uh, a producer can leave a, a bale in the field and then they, they move their herds up um, with an electric fence. A couple of advantages here. First of all, you're not hauling bales back and forth. So environmentally, a really smart solution. You're managing the movement with an electric fence. And then lastly, um, you're putting carbon back on the field, both through the manure and also the residue. So if you're doing this well, this is what that bale should look like. There's other ways to get to this point too. make sure they're not laying in it. You can roll bales out. Um, but uh, in the end, this is a really effective system to keep the cattle in the field. They're not moving a lot, especially with cow-calf pairs. Uh, and then they're getting a lot of carbon back on the field. Some other um, things, this is something I made when steel was really expensive. I just made from extra tin and junk wood around the farm. So more or less just my time and a bit extra wood, but it gets the feed up and off the ground. It has a slight cover uh, and it just simply increases the efficiency of just laying a, a bale on the ground. Uh, and again, other than the time and uh, a few beers it took me to, to make this uh, more or less a free feeding system. It's got, it's got hinges on the side, so you just swing those doors open, drive a bale, and, and, uh, and uh, you're off. These are some other ones that um, we initially had the round ring bale feeders, and they just seem to break all the time. They get bent. Uh, and this is one that costs probably twice what those round bale uh, feeders are but uh, they have mesh wire on the bottom of them. You can flip them over to get the, if there's anything residual in the bottom and they're just super duper rugged because they're square. Um, so something you may also want to look into at your feed store. The point is if you're buying cheaper systems but you're replacing those cheaper systems every two to three years, the cheaper system is not actually the cheaper system. Um, and then a, a feeder wagon there, these are always handy. Um, to put, if you do any green chopping, you can move, you can move the feeder through with the, uh, um, with your herd as they move through the pasture quite easy. Um, so also you can get these pretty reasonable at a sale. Uh, lastly, we talked about the, the, the baleage, again, saving on space, getting more of that plant that's cut uh, in early and also not having the stress of second, third and fourth raking. So um, something uh, you wanna do. We, we give only our, our feeders this, this high quality stuff. Um, and again, they eat it like candy. Um, more expensive feed to produce, but um, in the long run, I think a much more effective feed for the dollar because of all those other things I mentioned. Now, winter stockpile grazing, this is something we've not gotten to. Um, we just at the point where by December, uh, it's more effective for us and we don't have necessarily the land base to do this, but we do go up into early December. But if you do want to have the um, land base, um, you know, again, plants like this is probably a mix, a cocktail mix. Uh, some sorghum sedan in there, but you can uh, graze without having to put out bales well into the winter. Uh, any questions on that before I get into supplements? Not on bale grazing, but there was one back at the grading. So, um, yeah. It says, how does a private treaty arrangement determine grading? Okay, a pr private treaty arrangement, I'm not sure what that means. I, I think it's the um, buying of the animal Okay. This person wants to expand a little bit. Yeah, if they want to expand on that. Um, we, can, we can come back to it. Yeah, yeah, maybe expand on what, what they mean by that and then uh, uh, remind me we'll, we can come back to that one. Okay. Um, so let's talk about winter energy supplements. Um, again, these are very important because in the winter is a key part. If Even if you've got great momentum through the rest of the year and you stall in the winter, it can set you back months. So we continue unlimited offering of uh, uh, salt and mineral, which I think are very important in the winter. Again, salt and mineral, especially keeping that immune system strong. If the animal's healthy, it's going to keep gaining weight. If it's immune system's compromised, it'll 
eat less, it'll be less active and, and you may even end up in a fatality. So don't chintz on the salt and, and or mineral throughout the winter. We offer a, uh, a, a QLF, which is quality liquid feed, a molasses uh, energy booster to our feeders only in the wintertime. So they have unlimited access on that. That's a molasses base, so it does qualify for grass fed and it has salt in, in it as the inhibitor. So just like salty water, maybe some of us like a little salt on our food, but you don't want to drink too much of something that's got heavy salt. Salt acts as the inhibitor on that. And that is an amazing, uh, really has made a huge difference in our program. You know, again, think of it as somebody eating dessert with every meal versus somebody not eating dessert. Um, the, the calorie intake there is, is very important and really key to our getting to the level that we've got in terms of the choice finish. I offer kelp. I've just had great uh, heard great things about it. We've not had any issues with uh, pink eye since we started with kelp. It's high, high in iodine. Uh, now it's super expensive. So I don't want to act like it's a crutch that I use that you should use. I'm not getting any money there. But if you've got some minor immune system issues or think uh, you could benefit from that, maybe try out some kelp. At least um, we put uh, kelp, you know, limited amount of kelp in a feeder and uh, let them gulp it up. They may want to consider that if you've had some issues there. Did we get feedback on that question? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, her like private sale on the hoof. Okay. Um, so you could do two things. One, you could uh, allow that person to, if you're the producer, you can go in and our processor lets us go in and look at carcasses. Um, and so you can go in there and judge that animal. You can also, once you get good at it, the picture I showed you, that animal was going to definitely finish low choice. So you're not going to know exactly the grade, but you're going to know as select or choice. And once you get into choice, you're going to give whatever customer that is uh, a high quality eating experience that they'll come back for. So I think that's the important uh, part of that one. And if you if you know an animal is not going to grade well, maybe just put it in the hamburger. Hamburger, you know, even those animals are fine. Hamburger is the biggest item that we sell. So you know, don't say, oh gosh, I'm, I got to sell this one. I can't send it down the road and take a hit. Well, maybe, you know, if it's just one that you're having an issue with, first of all, I'd take those genes out of your pool. So make sure that that's not in your breeding uh, group. And then, um, you know, maybe try, try hamburger. So um, this is a molasses feeder <clears throat> that uh, just to kind of show the application on that one, the winter supplements. Um, here's another thing that we've started trying. Um, I've got a really good deal on some baleage and, uh, or some, some uh, round bales. I bought these bales. They were two years old. Um, on a remote road, I saw a guy out walking and it was a landowner and, and he had bales and obviously no cattle. So I got these bales for $15 a piece. And then what you see there is they are uh, our feed providers pumping in, actually just drizzling over on top, kind of like uh, frosting on a cake, uh, the QLF product. And what he does is he just kind of drizzles that over the top. It leaks down in through the whole bale and makes that marginal feed very scrumptious. And because of the QLF in it, uh, also highly nutritious. So the, the thought here is if you have that capability, buying some marginal feed, bringing carbon back to your farm, buying a, an economically efficient feed and tuning it up a little bit this way uh, is also something else to consider uh, a smart way to turn otherwise, you know, feed that you definitely wouldn't want to feed your finished group um, for 30 bucks a bale um, that can work pretty well. Um, so once they're they're drizzled on like that, we we would just stack them up and then because the stuff will continue to drizzle, you can see on that top bale, uh, nice and thick. And when you put that in the feeder, the cattle really to really go to town on them. Um, what uh, what do you recommend for a mineral block salt supplement configuration? Okay, excellent. Glad you mentioned that. So we do two. So we do uh, uh, just a general what I call the chocolate block. Uh, which is the brown one, and that's uh, overall uh, salt and some minerals. And we also, we, we built from old kind of wood blocks, we built these uh, um, salt feeders, which you can move easy with the four-wheeler with a chain and uh, move them from paddock to paddocks. The, these the blocks aren't, aren't, aren't quite expensive, so you don't want to probably have them in every single paddock and have them uh, deteriorate in the rain. But we also do, so we have the brown chocolate block, and we also always do selenium. If you go to, again, these different seminars, you know, all minerals are important, but selenium is really, really important to uh, productivity uh, and also immune system strength. Um, so we also always feed out the selenium block, which is usually a yellow or a kind of a green block. All right. And then um, when you're, when, when you have animals on the hoof and you're finish, finishing them out, do you ever use the ultrasound? 
machine to um... i have never used the ultrasound yet we've got one person here that has that and it's super expensive um and from what i understand the people that really like it love it but i've also heard that if you get a technician that's not really great um they may not uh as be as effective so we just we just sleeve them all we got a head gate and at that time i can double check your tags uh the vet can go in we do offer um, obviously no antibiotics, but we do offer some natural um, vaccinations. So we'll give them a vitamin A, um, and we do a pink eye shot because we do we can have historically uh, pink eye issues. But since we vaccinated and feed the kelp, we've not had any pink eye issues in the last two years. Uh, two pink eye, if you do have an issue with that in the summer, usually has to do with heat and humidity, fly transfer. Um, I've also uh, got on the genetic bandwagon where I've read and heard that if you have a cow that has pink eye some immune systems are much more um don't won't get pink eye versus others and if you have a cow that's got pink eye the chances that their offspring may have pink eye are quite high so think of that in your system as well and then coming back to the minerals do you prefer the blocks over loose salt or vice versa i prefer the blocks uh the loose salt can uh disintegrate quicker in a heavy rain um, in our feeders, um, we put the blocks in them. And then again, I just tow them with a four wheeler to the, to the next paddock. So that works best for us. I know people that have, uh, that put it in a like kind of a trough and use salt and they seem fairly successful, or they'll have a, a feeder that's got a cover on it. Uh, and you can use that too. Our model, we just try to totally minimize, as you see, I've tried to build a lot of the stuff myself to more or less success sometimes, but, um, try to stay away from, you know, that some of those feeders can cost you four or $500 as well, but. Okay. All right, super. Okay, let's get on to an exciting one that maybe some of you are really into, maybe some of you are not. So um, when I said winter management, that means both forage, but it also really, really uh, means be aware of temperature. Now critical body temperature uh, is around 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that means is that at that 20, uh, at the critical body temperature, any degree below that, um, the animal is going to be diverting uh, energy to staying warm. So there's a lot of different ways we can actually, even though let's say it may be um, minus 10 out, if you get that animal, get them out of the wind, make sure they're staying dry and have nice bedding, you can adjust that real feel of that animal, ideally closer back up to 20, and they don't have to put all their energy that, that they're... Uh, consuming into just simply staying warm. So seeing managing body temperature, um, critical weight gain and body conditions. And there's that scenario around uh, if the body temperature drops, you may lose a lot of your efficiencies into going into simply uh, staying warm. Okay, maybe you don't have a shed that they can get into, but uh, dry bedding, uh, even if some of it's supplied outside, it may not be expect as, as effective. But something simple as a windbreak. You know, we all know going out, maybe to fill the stove or whatever, you, that wind hits you in the face, the real feel is terrible. But you get behind a wall, you get out of the wind, um, you can uh, make the animals much warmer. Um, so that's something really to think about managing and it's free. Now that, this is a neat slide. This is much more scientific than I'm ever at. But what you do is you see the, the, the feed consumption and also this kind of this happy, this happy medium. So as we all know, in, in a really in a hot environment, animals will move less, they'll just stay in the shade. They can lose weight in those scenarios as well. But it makes sense that it happens the same thing in the cold environment there. If you have a shed where they can get in out of the, out of the wind, uh, you know, sheds aren't cheap, but if you've got a, a good sized herd, the gain that you can get from that windbreak effect uh, could be significant. Um, so again, here, provide some shelter as in a minimum of wind bakes, especially for your finishing cattle. Our cow-calf pairs are out on the range. They, you know, the cows, I try to give them um, a south-facing slope on a hill, uh, some tree cover and a, and a windbreak, you know, just for their comfort, but they're very durable. You don't need to necessarily provide expensive shelter for your cow-calf groups. Uh, harnessing the sun where possible. Again, I talked about a south-facing slope. South-facing, they're gonna get that good exposure to the sun. And even on a super cold day, that sun with, on a black hide can really, really make the difference. A nice slope is important because that means there's not gonna be sitting in a lot of stagnant water uh, as when the melt comes uh, and not having, you know, laying in water or a wet environment can also affect their, um, their body temperature. Dry bedding pays big dividends. You can buy, uh, you know, non-GMO corn stalks, fairly reasonable. Um, and uh, the bedding value of that by keeping the body uh, temperature higher uh, is significant. So the last one 
uh, proper bedding, just to try to quantify this and not just use a, you know, a directionally suggestive. Um, good bedding and windbreaks can result in a 20% improvement in feed efficiency. This is an Iowa State study. Um, and so that's an impressive number. So what does that, what does that mean for us? I, I just try to say, okay, is a 20% efficiency? Is that, yeah, it's a nice number. What, what, what would that actually mean? And I, I took the total feed intake um, for, let's say you got a group of feeders at 900 pounds. If you take, what would 20% feed efficiency mean? Well, if that's 8,100 pounds of feed, you're looking at, you know, directionally 650 bucks a month. So um, if you're $650 a month improvement in efficiency, you can buy uh, a few bales or you can put up a, a pretty reasonable windbreak uh, to justify uh, that improvement. So this is a shed we built. Um, I, I use the, uh, the argument with my wife about uh, bales stored outside lose 20% of their feed value and actually because you kind of got an outer crust that they won't eat and I did that over like eight years and it justified me building my shed so um, you may want to try that or may not but this the shed is again it's really effective because that to the south there's a big door that's always open uh, so to your right uh, there's a, uh, the door that's always open faces due south so even when there's a you know a, maybe a windy day but a heavy sun you'll see them laying in there and they'd like to stay in the sunny sunny part where but they're out of the wind and then we've also got a neat setup where we have this head gate all the way across the shed and we can feed from the inside out. So there's really almost zero loss other than maybe what they pull back in um, and we just can keep pushing up the feed. So uh, again, not a perfect system, but it, it works really slick. And, and in, in that manner, the, the, the shed did really pay for itself uh, quick. The only manure we ever manage is the manure pack from this bedding area. Uh, and we take that out in the spring. If you do have a manure pack, I used to spread it in the spring we let that compost now. And for example, the first year that I had the shed, I spread it all in the spring. I had 16 manure loads of very, very thick um, manure and 16 loads, you know, times whatever that costs you to do is a lot. Um, and after I let it compost all summer in a pile, I had four. So that four, not only is that much more effective, you're, you're only going out four times, you can spread it thinner and it's higher density. So quickly into the manure piece there, uh, even though that's not on our table. All right, so what is that, all that done for us? Another view of our working ladies here uh, in the Driftless. Um, with those, uh, kind of more or less a summary of everything we've added, we're, we're sending them off on average at 26 months now. Um, some we keep a bit longer and some I think are ready sooner, uh, but on average we're 26 months, but we've been able to go from about 28% um, choice in 2015 to 82% in 2020. Um, that gives us an extra dime if we reach choice for the co-op, which over 100 animals is a big deal. Uh, and then again, our, our direct customer base continues to grow as well. Uh, so just a couple more slides here as we add up and maybe get to questions. We're, we're doing perfect at 940. Um, some free uh, different uh, things that I've been a part of. Um, the grass-fed production systems, the pasture product website has a lot of information on it. Um, that you're free to uh, see there at the bottom of the wallcenter.org. Uh, and some other things that I really look at, Iowa, you know, uh, being from Wisconsin, we beat up on Iowa a lot, but they've got uh, Iowa State, uh, the Iowa Beef Center is really a lot of neat free calculators. Hayandforge.com talks a lot about RFQ, RFV, and give you some really cheap tips there. Uh, and Farm Biz Trainers are really neat overall. Um, tool to help you uh, financially with some decisions that you make in the, in the grazing program. So with that, we'll open it up to closing questions and we've got two or three minutes. So, so thanks for your attention. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So we had one come in um, going back to the, to the, the cheap bales that you were able to buy and then um, inject um, the additive in it. What exactly was that additive? That was exactly nothing more than what's in our, our, is the QLF product that if you looked on the truck there, he had a, he had a big tote and that's the exact same tote in the same truck he used to fill that feeder. So all he did was he had a little pump and instead of pumping that into my tank, he just pumped it into, you know, in a circle on top of those bales. So it's the um, QLF makes a, a grass fed, uh, what we call it a grass fed energy booster. And the core ingredients are simply liquid molasses uh, and then a salt inhibitor. Uh, so they don't, otherwise they would sit there and eat it all day. Gotcha. Um, and then how well are the um, 
Aberdeen's, so the low lines, viewed at sales versus larger commercial Angus? Yeah, they're, they're, they get beat up. Um, and I think the reason is that the conventional farmer won't get that massive carcass that they love to see and they know it. Um, so they kind of think they, they, they'll be robbed. You know, if you're looking for cows, especially, and you go to a conventional market and they're getting beat up, that's a deal for you. You know, you can pick up a conventional cow and put it in your system if it's low line. But that's the only thing I can think of because they work so well in grass programs, but they won't. Again, I've got cousins and neighbors that the badge of honor for them is just to have the most massive animal that they can produce. Um, you know, we don't have those crutches that, or the, the feeds that we're not allowed to do those. So um, again, I, I just stay away and I work with a lot of young and beginning farmers. And I, I, when I hear them, they call and they say, oh, Rod, I, I, I got a really great deal. I just cringe because I know it's probably a, you know, a Jersey Angus cross or some really, you know, lanky Holsteins that they're really going to struggle and they're going to pay for in the long term for that great deal. Um, and then the slides are available on SCED afterward, but would you mind going back to um, uh, your internet uh, info slide for people to write down if they if that, oh, that's sure. easier for them? Um, yep. This uh, one here, yeah. Or right there, yep. <laughs> so uh, Rod, looks like we are um, have gotten to all our questions and it's um, we're getting to our time so that we can get to our, our next presentation here in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for what you shared. Your experience is uh, solid gold for us um, and uh, we really appreciate what you've done and uh, we've gotten lots of good comments. Um, so um, if, if we were where you could hear us, we'd be giving you a, a rousing <laughs> round of applause.